it always comes down to cognitive ability, right? The thing I think in the novel that makes the difference about Arcos is that he becomes self-aware, right? There's a kind of uh, self-awareness in that AI. And so the argument always is once an AI becomes self-aware, well, yeah, of course, then we'd have to think about them as being a, a kind of social person. But I think even before we reach that level of programming, and for some people, they think that that will never happen. There are some serious researchers who think that that can never occur. There are others who think it can occur. So let's put that on the side for a second. I think even before we come to that level of self-aware programs, for lack of a better description, or conscious computers, whatever you want to call it, I think even before we reach that point, we're going to have machines that are interacting with us in very social ways that are going to require us to behave towards them with some modicum of respect, for lack of a better description. So I'll give you a good, a good example. There are now a lot of older people in the world, just because of the way the population has developed, right? So there's more older people than younger people in the, in the US. The problem is even worse in Japan, where you have a hugely old population versus a very small young population. And Japan is running into trouble. They have not enough workers to take care of their elderly, not enough healthcare workers. And Japan has no immigration. So it's not like you can bring in people from elsewhere. They have like 2% immigration per year. So the Japanese response to how do we care for the old people? Elder care robots. Give grandma and grandpa a robot that'll help bathe them, feed them, give them their pills, and help them get to bed and out of bed in the morning. And you can bet these robots are not going to be really intelligent. They're not going to be super bright AIs. They're going to be just functional robots to help grandma and grandpa get out with their lives. But you can also bet grandma and grandpa are going to get attached to that robot because it's going to be doing very intimate things with them dining with them, bathing them, feeding them. And as a result, what happens when the company says, well, we got to take Robbie the robot away from grandma and grandpa? My guess is grandma and grandpa are going to be really upset because they've grown attached like we do to our dogs. So I think before the machines become socially aware or super intelligent or whatever you want to call it, they're going to become social interactive objects that we are going to treat as if they were intelligent. And that's going to be the trouble. I mean, that, that's where we're going to have the really interesting things take place. And again, I use animals as, as an example. You can just see how dogs have changed over time. At one time, dogs were a tool for us to hunt with. Now we talk about them as if they're our children. Right? We talk about pet parents, and we talk about you know, fashion shows for dogs and things. Crazy ideas from you know, 100 years ago, if you were looking forward to see what people were doing in the 20th century and 21st century with animals. I think robots are going to fall into the same kind of pattern of use. We're going to find these things growing into our lives in a way that we can't really say, you know, just get rid of it now. It's going to be too important to us. The way you prevent the robo-apocalypse, yeah, it's a good question. I think, first of all, one thing that we need is really good training in our schools with regards to math, science, and technology. With really good understanding, not only of the capabilities of our technology, but also the social consequences. I think oftentimes we educate children um, and young adults in you know, the principles of mathematics, the principles of science, and the engineering principles and stuff, and we forget the sort of social component. We forget the moral component. And I think that has to be as much a part of the education as the technical component, as the scientific component. Once you have people who are able to look at their technology in ways that are critical, in ways that are informed, in ways that are um, in touch with the broader spectrum of social, moral, political questions, then you won't have engineers designing just because they can, but they'll ask questions. Why? Why should I make this? Are there social consequences to what I design and what those social consequences are? So I think one is education. Um, I think another thing is in programming. I think we have to sort of look at Asimov's laws and say, you know, it, if indeed we have socially interactive robots, what kinds of decision-making skill do we want to integrate into the programming? And is there a way to make like something along the lines of Asimov's laws computable so that we're able to protect ourselves from robots? And thirdly, I think, you know, it just is a matter of us thinking about our social world. What sort of social world do we want? You could imagine a social world in which we all have our robot slaves. 
But do we want to live in a world with slaves, whether they're mechanical or not? What kind of world will we have if we have mechanical slaves? And we have to ask these questions now because by the time these things become available, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too much a part of our reality to step back from it and say, now we can make a conscious decision. I think the conscious decision-making time begins now. And that's how you prevent the robot apocalypse.